Our broadcast is brought to you by Broadlink, serious bandwidth for serious business. Ford, go further. Brother. And MTN everywhere you go. This year's Dakar saw many surprises throughout, especially for all the South African competitors. With Rion van finishing 13th on his first attempt, Daryl Curtis in 32nd after sustaining a bad injury due to an accident, and Brett Cummings in 43rd position after helping a teammate for hours. In this episode, we catch up with the riders as they tell us their journey through the adventure of Dakar 2013. Well, you know, it's fantastic. Uh, it's been a whole year of preparation, and I was very happy to go back to Dakar with Rian. And our sponsors enabled us to get some extra cash together. We bought a ride on the KTM factory team, and off we went. Uh, straight back to Lima, that's where we finished last year. And I was quite excited because there were millions of people there at the finish last year. And the atmosphere was the same. It was lively, and uh, it really was exciting. Yeah, uh, we went a couple of days early, that's two days early before the event. So uh, I was quite fortunate that Mike from Broadlink came, came with us. So uh, we strolled around uh, Lima a little bit, and you know I had a few days to relax and, and, and get all the jet lag out. But once the race started, you know you're in a little bubble, and uh, you don't see much other than the race because you start from the one bivouac and end with the next. So and you're so so busy with your road books and, and trying to organise your life for the next day that there's just no time for everything anything else. It was fantastic having Rian along, you know, we've pretty much raced the whole racing career together, we've done everything, you know, the extreme enduros in six days and you name it, we've done it. And now to go to Dakar was like the grand finale, it was really fantastic. And uh, the nice thing was all the preparation we did during the year, going to Namibia and riding on road books. We did two races in Morocco, which are using exactly the same GPS and uh, navigation systems that we use at Dakar. And he definitely had a huge advantage going into the Dakar. Yeah, I'll be quite honest with you, I was really uh, crapping myself for the first couple of days, especially on day one, you don't know what to expect. Even on the liaison section, you're nervous, there's people around you, and you're never sure you're doing the right thing or, you know, everything's new to you, but uh, after about three or four days, you settle in and the nerves start to calm down. How are you feeling? A bit nervous, eh? Yeah? Yeah. I hope uh, I can find my way today. I'm lost stay on top. Yeah, it's a lot of ma motivation when you when you ride off that start podium and you've got uh, South, South Africans, you know, Mike Brown from Broadlink was there and my mom and my brother came along and things like that and uh, is, you see South African flags are in the, and they're cheering for you and then you pull away and then the streets are just lined. I mean, for 100 kilometers, there's just people everywhere, all the bridges on the sides of the roads and that, it, it motivates you, it makes you feel really good and, uh, and you realize how big the Dakar really is. Yeah, I was quite stoked. You know, in the beginning, uh, I didn't want to get ahead of myself. You know, you see some of the faster riders and you try and hang with them. But the problem is, uh, if I try and stay with them, which is not the problem on speed-wise, but I kept losing my place in the road book. And my goal from the beginning was safety. And I didn't want to get ahead of myself. So if I couldn't keep up with the road book, I'd slow down and, and make sure that when there's a caution, I try and, and match them up all the time. Because at the end of the day, it's uh, the safety that counts and, and you, know, you need to stay on top to get to the finish. Well, day two was a really good day for me and I qualified uh, 25th after the prologue, Rian was 15th. And uh, they soon got lost. And that's really the big thing about that guys, to, to read the road book correctly and not get lost. Guys ended up going down the wrong valley, including me. That time I'd, uh, I was riding with Helder Rodriguez and uh, as luck would have it, I saw him, he turned left and he went over the next bank of dunes. He realized we were in the wrong valley. And uh, I followed him, you know, everybody else was on the, to the right of me. There was lots of dust down there and I think that's where Rian was as well. So I turned left, I followed Helder over the bank of dunes and then soon enough the waypoint arrow popped up and I knew I was right and I was like, how did he know that? So this is the advantage. Those guys have got the experience. They've done it year in and year out. And they managed to figure out where, they look back in the road book, where did I go last, get lost? And they go and find the good way. And uh, I finished sixth that day. It was an amazing result for Curtis on stage two, whilst Van Eekirk was climbing the order. I started feeling more comfortable, especially on the back and with the terrain. 
but uh, I still make quite a few uh, uh, navigational errors. So the problem is uh, running in about 15th position when you get into the dunes. The track just splits into 15 different directions and uh, then I start doubting myself and uh, that's where I need to learn to get more comfortable with this, especially on the caps that uh, you know that you're on the right route. And uh, the problem is I ended up following some other riders, especially some of the top riders, including Cyril. And you think, no, they have to know where they're going after so many years of Dakar experience, but they still do make mistakes. And uh, you know, I learned a valuable lesson there that you need to trust your instincts and, and, and follow your own nose. Navigation is such an important factor in the Dakar and even the top riders get lost. Daryl tells us more. Yeah, I was in a much better place than I was a year before. You know, starting 144th, I had to fight my way through all the dust and everything else on the Argentinian roads. I found myself now in the dunes. There's no dust and you can see the next rider and, and all of a sudden it just changes the whole game. The next day, uh, a couple of riders in front of me got lost again. Beretta, Pedrero, um, those guys. David Castile started behind me and we soon hooked up and, and rode together. He found a good way, I followed him. And uh, we finished the stage we opened the stage, first and second at the end. Cyril uh, Dupre and Ruben Ferrier managed to pass us just before the end. And I thought, hey, I'm going to have another great day. And the results come out, and I think it was 18th for the, the third day, because everybody else behind us had followed our tracks and made up time on us. It's a very clever game you have to play at Dakar. They're very tactical. Yeah, I must say, the riding was the easier part for me than the, in the rally because what they don't tell, show you on television is that uh, you start anything from quarter past four to quarter to five in the morning to do a liaison section you know anything from 200 to nearly 400 kilometers and then you have to do your racing section which could be anything also up to about 400 kilometers and another 100 to the end so you end up doing 850 kilometers on the bike for the day and they don't show you that on television so you arrive at the bivouac back five, six in the afternoon. You have to go for a shower, give your bike to the mechanic, get your road book sorted, go eat, go riders briefing and uh, get to bed, you know, and then it's 10, half past 10. And uh, back up at three, half past three again and do all, all over again the next day. So the days are very short, you know, the, the nights at least. And they don't show you that. And after two weeks, it does catch up to you. And uh, it's, it's the secret of, of trying to keep a cool head and, and you know, not overexert yourself. Well, they say Dakar is the greatest adventure on earth, and it really is. You know, in between all the racing stages, you've got these massive long uh, liaisons, and uh, to put you in the picture, it's like uh, riding on your bike from Johannesburg to Durban, and then ri racing an off-road national, and then uh, riding another 100 kilometers back to Maritzburg, and you do that day in and day out for 15 days. Um, and there's so much scenery to see on the way. You know, crossing over when we crossed from. Uh, Kalama to Salta, for example, we crossed over the Andes on a jeep track at 5,000 meters uh, on a very, uh, a, a not very well used road. And uh, you know, you start seeing all those big cactuses and the different colors of the earth and things like that. And remote areas, it's really beautiful. You know, for the amount of money you pay for Dakar, you expect to have a nice hotel, nice bedroom, you know, good, you know, good accommodation. But uh, that's not the true story. You arrive from day one when you're in the bivouac. They got port and you can imagine there's 3,000 people using the same port and uh, the worst part is uh, when you walk towards uh, the dinner place, you need to walk past the port and uh, the setup every day was the same. So you get the smell of the port before you arrive uh, wherever you need to eat. So already you've switched off. And then uh, the showers is another thing, it's a cold shower. So I don't mind the cold showers because at least the conditions, it was warm, but after 15 days of cold showers, you just don't feel clean. And some bivouacs were so dusty that uh, by the time you get out the shower, I don't even think you make it 10 meters past the shower, then you're back, you're just dirty again. And then the wind picks up, you can't see the next camp next to you, and there's just sand everywhere. You go sit down to eat, there's sand everywhere. Sand in your food, sand in your, just sand everywhere. Um, the conditions are hard, but you know, I think like after a week you just live with it and you don't even bother anymore. Everybody smells dirty and everything's full of dust and you just get on with it. <laughs> that's what it's been like here today. Are you having a pasta or a sand? Oh, sand in the pasta. Have you turn pasta? 
The following stages, I, I had a bit of maintenance. You know, I was always around the 15th and 20th mark, and I was comfortable there. That's really where where I belonged, I was happy, and I knew that consistency would pay off at the end of the day, as Rian showed. You know, Rian started coming through. I recognized his talent in Morocco already. Um, he, he's got the whole package. To ride a rally, you have to be able to ride that big rally bike, you have to ride it smoothly, you have to be conservative, and you have to be a good navigator and follow the roadbook. And uh, Rian's got that whole package. He started coming through with better and better results slowly and as I went along I had a couple of little hiccups. You just have to get lost once and you lose 10 places and then you start the next morning in a slower group with guys that are less experienced and tend to get lost more. And uh, Rian got himself into a group slightly ahead of me uh, with more experienced guys and he managed to maintain that result throughout the Dakar. Um, so he rode a fantastic race. Yeah, you know, the results was, we were a little bit blown away, we, we were lying, but you know, it's a long race, you need to keep a cool head. You know, Daryl unfortunately had an accident on the fourth last day, but uh, he still managed to get to the end uh, and push through. You know, the goal was for both of us to make it to, to San Diego, which we did. And uh, I really admire him for uh, pushing through and getting to the end. You know, I saw how much pain he had. But uh, also, he didn't want to go in uh, the camper van, which crossed the Andes. I think that was another excuse, because uh, that was like, a, I think, an eight or nine hour camper trip across the Andes, and uh, I don't think it was a, a pleasurable drive. When getting lost in the sand dunes, so much time can be lost or gained. Well, when we all got lost that day, uh, it was the same thing. We went down the wrong valley. We went down a left riverbed instead of the right one. Uh, it got really technical at the end with a lot of loose rocks. It started raining. And, uh, you know, we got mixed up with all the, all the pro riders were lost, the whole, everybody. It was, uh, I was riding with Oliver Seta and Consalves. Oliver Payne, the uh, race leader, he finished right behind me that day. I was 76th, he was 77th. I had um, 18 elite riders behind me. Now, the disadvantage that we had is we don't have uh, yellow numbers. A yellow number is basically a rider that's recognized as an elite rider. So they've got an opportunity twice in the race to go and use, call it a joker. They can move up in the field. Oh, I had a bad day yesterday, guys. Can I start 20th? You can change your position. So there were 18 elite riders behind me. So instead of starting 76th the next morning, I started 94th. And Rian was supposed to start 37th, and he started 54th. And the next day was on the Argentinian roads. It was in the forest. We had a 450 kilometer special test divided into two parts, and it was dusty. And we had to take massive chances. I had a big crash on that day as well. I made up 61 positions on that day, but by taking massive risk. And um, this is one of the questions that we had is, you know, why did we not get any Columbus? Because we were supposed to. Another hurdle for the riders to bear is the Fesh Fesh. This being Rion van Niekerk's first Dakar meant it was his first encounter with it. Yeah, you know, it's very hard to explain the fish fish. You know, Daryl's been telling me about the fish fish for a whole year, you know, how bad it is. The first couple of days, I saw fish fish on my roadbook, but I didn't think anything of it. I think it was day four or five in Peru, um, probably 10 kilometers from the start. We, we really had a, I had my first encounter with fish fish. It's a bit like a swimming pool filled with uh, baby powder or even cement powder. You can't see it, it looks rock hard, but as soon as you ride into it, it's just powder and it just goes in everywhere. You can't even control the bike, it just, whatever happens, happens when you hit the stuff. And uh, yeah, I had my first crash and it's not too pleasant, but you know, you don't get too hurt. It's just powder everywhere. Um, but yeah, that was my first encounter with Fish Fish. Unfortunately, accidents do happen in a race like this, and with four stages to go, Daryl Curtis had a massive accident early into the stage. He tells us more. You know, it was fantastic to have Rihanna and myself both inside the, the top 20. Uh, Rihanna at that stage was lying 14th, and I was lying 17th. Uh, it was on the day to Fiambala. Uh, Fiambala is notorious for uh, taking competitors out. It's a very rough stage. There's lots of sand and. Uh, uh, it's traditionally a very hot day, very dry, soft sand, all the cars get stuck and it's normally, at last year it was before the rest day. Uh, this year I'd come across Dave Reeve, he'd had a crash at the 140 kilometer mark and broken his leg, so I stopped with him briefly 
he was taken care of. And as I took off again, there was a Brazilian rider that I'd been riding with quite a bit. And I just tried to bridge the gap between me and him. And I missed a triple caution danger in my, in my road book. And uh, I had a monster crash. I landed upside down on my head. The bike hit me. And uh, as I lay there, I couldn't breathe. And eventually I got up and I got going. And uh, I knew that I'd, I'd heard something. I literally rode back to the bivouac. The last 70 k's out of the special in first and second gear. I knew my shoulder was sore, my back was sore. I wasn't in a good space. And um, when I got back that night, I went off to the medics, went for x-rays and everything else, but they only x-rayed my shoulder. Um, I later found out when I got home that I've actually fractured two vertebrae in my back and torn ligaments in my shoulder. And I didn't think I was going to start the next morning. When I woke up the next morning, um, the KT mechanics luckily had prepared my bike for me. We had to wake up at Hoppers 3. It was a crossing of the Andes. And we had to start off with a 400 kilometer liaison section and uh, a 319 kilometer racing stage after that. And I, I was in tremendous pain. I took too many painkillers. When I went for breakfast, I came back. I couldn't find my pits. I was in a bit of a dwell. But I got on the bike and I, I rode the liaison section. Um, incredible pain. I could hardly hold onto the bar. As I went on, my shoulder started loosening up a little bit. And when I went into the racing stage, that 319 kilometers was the longest stage of my life. I've never been in so much pain ever. I had to really dig deep. Uh, we had some June crossings, and um, yeah, I just don't know how I got through that stage. But I got to the end, um, went off to the doctors again, medics, try a bit of, do a bit of physio, and uh, I knew then after that we had, well, there were three days left to go to Santiago, and uh, there was no way I was going to drive in a camper van over the Andes. So, <laughs> so I pushed hard and dug deep and, and made the finish. For sure, the, the last two days especially, I didn't push at all. The guy in front of me was about 20 or 25 minutes, and the guy behind me was nearly 30 minutes behind me, so I knew I was pretty safe. I just didn't need to make any mistakes. And during the last two days, I ended up riding with a guy that's behind me anyway, and uh, I overtook him, so I knew I was quite safe for my, for my result, and uh, I didn't want to push anything further and, and, and take any risk. My, my first goal was to get to the end. You know, there's nothing worse than doing a first Dakar and not getting to the end. That's, you know, it leaves like a, a little bit of unfinished business, so I'm really glad that everything went well for me. It was a really tough day for me. I'd had enough by then, you know, you just wanted to, I wanted to not ride. I wanted to get off that motorbike. I, I didn't want pain and the jerking around on my shoulder anymore. I, I, and when we rolled into Santiago and uh, uh, to the finish, um, I can't tell you how good it felt. It was over and, uh, and I could now rest up at last. and I can't describe it, but uh, it's been a whole year to get there. And uh, especially with myself and Daryl pulling over the finish line together, it's a really great feeling and uh, you know, I'm happy for both of us to make it to the end. The big question is, would they be back for another Dakar? Sure, Dakar 2014, I don't know. I'm gonna lick my wounds a little bit. We've gotta go and get all the sponsors together, chat to them and uh, chat to Rian and see which direction we're gonna take. But uh, I will be back at Dakar sooner or later. For sure, it's, uh, you know, I think uh, it's a bug's bitten a little bit. Uh, it was a good experience for me. Uh, I like the road book and the way the race was run. Yes, it's dangerous. The Dakar is a new challenge and I quite enjoy it. Broadlink were the proud headline sponsor of the team. We spoke to marketing manager Nicole van Niekerk of their experience. I think firstly Broadlink is a company that's very passionate about sports and very passionate about developing sports people in our country. Um, so for us, we've been involved in off-road biking for a couple of years and really what that means is as a sponsor we not only got to um, had the opportunity to be involved in a great plat platform for our brand, but it also meant that we could make a significant difference to a particular sport in the country. Um, by extending that to our Dakar sponsorship, we, in 2012 that was with Daryl, and then we had the opportunity which we jumped at to also sponsor the KTM factory team of Daryl and Rion in 2013. Um, I think that gave us a really good platform to, to show our brand, showcase our brand, um, and also support a South African, a truly South African team, and get top riders like Rian and Daryl out there and competing globally. They might have had the opportunity prior to this. I think that's given us quite a pride in what we've done. I think we were all watching with bated breath. 
um, internally in the office. We sort of rotated all the emails that went round and we said, you know, how are the guys doing? And everyone wanted to know how Daryl and Rion were doing. When Daryl hurts himself, we were all um, devastated, but we just saw Rion going from strength to strength as he went through the race and we were so immensely proud. And I think, you know, the knock-on effect of that is we've spoken to each of our team members, our whole company has spoken to their families and gotten them involved and we've just seen an immense support. Um, we've, we've been really proud and very lucky to have such good spokespeople. Rian and Daryl did us very, very proud and well done guys. Glenn Grundy and Brett Cummings were also there to fly the South African flag. Due to mechanical problems, Glenn Grundy had to retire after just two days. However, Brett Cummings finished the race in an impressive 43rd position. Basically started going to, well, making plans to go to the 2011 uh, Australasian Safari. And um, I, I had a big crash. The, at the National just before that event and was unable to, to participate. Um, and then that entry got rolled over to the following year. Um, but in the process, Glenn Grundy was also involved in, in going to the 2011 Australasian Safari. He competed, injured himself. But um, then we started a relationship with the, the Australian-based company called uh, GHR Honda and uh, set up a deal with them to, to take us to Dakar and we fought our entry to, to ASO with, with Dakar and, and um, we were accepted in July uh, of 2012. At the Australasian Safari, Brett Cummings won the Dakar Challenge, giving him a free entry into the 2013 Dakar. Well, I, I wasn't exactly sure what the Dakar Challenge was at that point in time. Um, we'd already been accepted, as I said, uh, to, to, to at, compete at Dakar. Um, but went to the Australasian Safari, uh, entered the Dakar Challenge, and you know I, I took nothing of it. I thought, give it a go. Uh, and by about day four or so, my chances started looking a bit better at, at winning the Dakar Challenge, and it was, regardless, uh, better than even winning the event overall, um, because it had better, more value to it. You don't want to go and mess things up, you take it really easy. The bike was new to us um, and, you know, you were just unsure of the way in which they, they marked the road book. So, took it really easy, made sure we finished the stage and uh, just the experience of all the crowds was mind-blowing. Brett tells us of the troubles of Glenn Grundy's stage. His, his bike had a few small issues leading up to the start of the event. It, it got a bit hotter than the rest of the bikes on the prologue, uh, or the 13K special stage of stage one. And um, the guys looked into it and, uh, you know, didn't really find anything. And uh, the assumptions to that are that the bike overheated on the racing stage of stage two. Um, he wasn't. He was through the dune section, so it wasn't that the bike was uh, struggling or anything like that. He was on a pan or something, and um, the bike just lost compression and uh, didn't go anymore. First of all, I think it was stage four um, was a bit of a challenge. It was really spectacular. The dunes were mind-blowingly big, um, and the scenery was unbelievable and I uh, came across one of the other competitors in our team, uh, Todd Smith, number 156, and he had also broken down. So it wasn't having a good track record for the team, obviously you, you get a bit nervous with regards to it, and uh, assisted him a little bit uh, with, with no success and then went about two k's down the road I thought, you know, there's only 30 k's left of the stage. Let me turn around and go and see if he's willing to get towed out and give it a go. So we, we thought we'll give it a go and carry on down the road and just see how far we get. Um, it proved to be a bit of a challenge and eventually made it to the end of the stage. A lot of sand, a lot of climbing out of the dunes and getting helped with, with spectators and locals. And I lost a fair amount of time. So that puts you way back in the field. Um, and then it's a catch-up game. I uh, got back half past seven that night into the bivouac, didn't get to riders briefing, missed out on a few critical changes to the road book for the next day, and that just compounded and I lost another 45 minutes because I didn't get those changes to the road book done. Um, 
from there on it was a slow catch up but once I got into the the pace that suited my riding style things went a lot better and I really started enjoying myself a lot of preparation goes into being able to finish the race we found out what some of the challenges were the biggest thing is it's not a very difficult race there's no serious technical uh, difficulties that I experienced fitness was really good there are a few things that were that I would do differently with regards to preparing for it but all in all we were generally really well prepared for it except there is no preparation for sleep uh, deprivation I'd love to do a Dakar another Dakar and uh, rather sooner than later um, hopefully by having gone there and, and being successful in, in finishing and having a reasonable result. I'm hoping it will be a bit easier to get some sponsors on board and absolutely I'll have to go back again in 2014. A huge congratulations to all our South African and African riders. You did our continent proud. This broadcast was proudly brought to you by Broadlink. Serious bandwidth for serious business. The all new Ford Ranger Brother at your side and MTN.